half a day and good afternoon. Um, today we are going to do a uh, resolution presentation to the Guam Association of Realtors uh, to advocate for uh, the Realtor Safety Month. And uh, I think this is an opportune time uh, to go ahead and invite the Guam Association Realtor members up. Up here, yes. Please join us. Yes. Uh, yes, you just, we can balance out. All right. okay. Okay. I'd like to thank all the members of the Guam Association of Realtors that are here today uh, for the, to reinforce Safety Month and the great work that they've done within the community, really advocating for the health and safety of their clients. Uh, this, is, this is very significant because right after this presentation, we're going to move into our round table um, meeting for some of our bills, and one of them is the landlord-tenant bill. And that bill also advocates for the health and safety of the tenant, but also ensures the rights of the landlord. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, being here today, uh, for your service in, in providing homes for our locals, and for all the hard work you do. Relative to recognizing the Guam Association of Realtors on the celebration of Realtor Safety Month on Guam during the month of September 2017, and to further commending the Guam Association Realtors for provi providing educational opportunities for realtors in order to increase their knowledge about the well-being and protection of themselves, their clients, and for their commitment to promoting professionalism in the real estate business. Be it resolved that the speaker and the chairperson of the Committee on Rules certify and the legislative secretary attest to the adoption hereof and that the copies of the same be therefore, thereafter transmitted to the Guam Association of Realtors and to the Honorable Edward J. B. Calvo I. Magalahan Guahan. Um, so I'd like to invite you to, uh, maybe a couple of you, to, to come and share um, the work that you have been doing and um, in recognizing the safety month. Thank you. We, we're holding a, uh, a special, a special meeting on the 29th of September. Right? Come tell us. Um, with, tell us a little bit about it. Okay. Uh, we are very happy to partner with the Guam Police Department in um, in promoting uh, real tour safety uh, as a means to be a part of their uh, um, what they need to remember daily in. Um, ensuring that they are uh, safe on the job uh, and not just an option. Uh, while we promote and recognize this once a year in September, uh, we, do, uh, we would like to ensure that the members understand that realtor safety is an everyday thing. Definitely, definitely. So there will be, uh, we have, even the National Association of Realtors is very concerned about this. So we have a bunch of new not regulations, but suggestions that they've made, you know, for, for realtor safety, because there has been some some instances nationwide that, you know, that we don't want to have to have ever happen again. Is there anyone else you would like to comment? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank Senator Munya for joining us and the Vice Speaker, if you'd like to say some remarks. No? Okay. Well, we'd like to thank the Guam Association of Realtors for all their hard work uh, and to being a very proactive model uh, in our community. Uh, you guys, uh, the association really sets a bar for a lot of the issues that come with real estate. And so I want to thank you for that, for your commitment. And you're also federally recognized, so that's even more important, right? So that you're also understanding what's happening nationally, but also within our, within our local community. So thank you for your hard work and your commitment uh, to, this, to this mission. So with that being said, this is your resolution. Thank you, thank you Madam President. Much. And this concludes our presentation resolution.
Half a day and good afternoon. The Committee on Housing, Utilities, Public Safety, and Homeland Security will now convene this hearing. Uh, correction, this is a roundtable meeting. Today is September 13 and it is currently 1400 hours. For the record and in accordance with open government law, notices were sent out via email to all senators, stakeholders, and main media broadcasting outlets on Tuesday, September 13. And the second notice on Friday, September 8. The committee will be conducting a roundtable discussion on bills 144, 145, 146, and 147 in that order. Just a, just a, a real quick history. Um, you, upon uh, writing this bill, I reached out to as many landlord and tenants that we could. Uh, we also compared uh, landlord and tenant laws uh, nationally and also in the inter internationally with other countries. Um, and doing a little bit of historical research, uh, I discovered that this, the current law that, uh, that is in place in regards to detainers um, has, was, hasn't been updated within the past 40 years. And so this bill uh, is an attempt to to address that and also to address the health and safety of our tenants, but also ensuring the rights of the landlords because really essentially uh, what we're trying to do is to protect the people of Guam when they do rental agreements or lease agreements with some landlords that uh, you know, uh, rent out uh, places to dwell, li you know, living places to live in that are, you know, below living conditions, subpar conditions. And so that's really the effort that we're trying to do with this landlord and tenant bill. Um, I asked for this roundtable hearing for all of these bills because a lot of these bills, I, all of these bills I feel have a significant role that play in our community. And uh, I am no expert. And so I, I wanted to have everyone come in and to voice uh, their recommendations on how we could better this bill. And this is really that we keep in, in, in focus and in mind that this is for the people of Guam and also to protect their health and safety. And so ensuring that that is the intent and that no special interest group um, was preferred over to another, I wanted to host this round table to get all of your input and to see what we can do as a community to improve this bill and, and to make this bill fair um, and, and right by the people of Guam. And so with that being said, we'll address the landlord-tenant bill, bill number 144, which is an act to add a new chapter 48 to division one of Title 21 Guam Code annotated relative to establishing the Guam Landlord and Tenant Rental Act of 2017. Um, I'd like to start first with Guam Housing Corporation and then uh, perhaps Gura, and then the rest of the government agencies and other members um, of the community to chime in after that uh, on how we can improve this bill. Okay, Mr. President. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, if you'd excuse me, I, I, I really uh, have more comment on the other bills uh, subsequent to this. Um, as Guam Housing basically uh, manages the properties in its inventory and that, that we have constructed for the purposes of rental. Um, we really only manage our own uh, tenant agreements. And so we have no issues with the bill. Uh, in our review, we think it's well written. Um, I think this may be more geared towards uh, maybe Gura perhaps and the real estate community. So we'll defer on this one, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Mayor Doris for her presence. Uh, and also my colleagues, Vice Speaker Terlahi and Senator Munya. Uh, please bear with me, yes? <laughs> okay, uh, Gurup, do you have any input on this landlord-tenant bill? Uh, good, morning, good afternoon, Madam Chair. I just want to say from Gurup that we do appreciate um, trying to working towards updating. We think that leveling the, leveling the playing field is an important issue, and we will uh, support and, and continue with the discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Leon Gurup. Uh, is there anybody else that it is, uh, it is open to speak if anybody else would like to comment on bill number 144? Um, 
Uh, just to, just to um, update everyone, I have been receiving a lot of testimonies on this bill, um, and I've met with some of these individuals here today to address their concerns. So um, we will take all of that into consideration and make some amendments to the bill because a lot of the recommendations are very, very good recommendations that we cannot ignore. Um, and then uh, perhaps once we amend the bill with some of those recommendations, we'll have the public hearing. Thank you, uh, Senator. Um, I'm Chris Felix from the Guam Association of Realtors. We've met and we've sent you our concerns with the bill and um, we're just, uh, our goal is to make it a fair bill for landlords and tenants and uh, to really ensure that this bill and the understanding and to correct that this bill is for residential uh, leases only and not commercial because that is a whole different animal and the laws of, I mean, it's, it's completely different. But we've sent you a fairly long list of our concerns and suggestions and recommendations and we thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Felix. Uh, yes, to address the, the concern whether it is uh, what is this bill specifically for? It is for residential leases. It does not uh, address the commercial aspect of the landlord-tenant law. So, you know, one bite at a time, right? So we're, we're taking small steps to eventually get there. Um, but uh, this is a need to do, uh, especially since it hasn't been addressed in the last 40 years. And as we all know, Guam's economies have changed, the government has changed, the way we do, thing has, think, the way we do things have changed. And so it is only, um, I think, providence that we address this now when we work with all community members to improve this law. Yes, Madam President. I have a question. Um, the things that we've gone over with you and everything are not part of the handouts yet, right? So yes, ideally, would you like us to go over all of those again in front of everyone here? Yes, perhaps you can do that so that everyone has an understanding of, of some of your concerns. Oh. Do you I think those? that would be fair. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll quickly try to summarize. Um, first, our main concern was that it's residential. Um, our second concern was in the definitions. We thought that you should add the word casualty, define days, whether we're talking of working days or uh, calendar days, because that can make a big difference. Um, and add uh, normal wear and tear uh, as one of the definitions because we think that's very important to protect the tenant that they're exempted under normal wear and tear. Um, then our next, uh, our concerns on some of the security deposits to make sure that the tenant is exempted from normal wear and tear, that the landlord cannot subtract from the security deposit normal wear and tear to protect the tenant. Um, we hope that we could remove or rework uh, some of the tenant's recovery if they don't receive the security deposit in a timely manner. Um, then under 48202 uh, about landlord, the things the landlord must provide, we basically agree with everything except those items that are in landlord's control. For example, an elevator in a condominium is not, the, uh, the landlord can't control that, that's a homeowner's association. And like Epau Gardens and Apaceno Gardens, it took them a year to fix their elevators and to hold the landlord responsible for that type of, uh, just is not fair. I mean, so we wanted to make sure that the, it's written to the point where the, the land, it's so long as it's in the landlord's control that the landlord must provide the certain things. Um, uh, the next thing is, um, the next main item, besides some of the minor ones we sent, was access, the rights of access. We sent you a, from the Hawaii law, a section of uh, what Hawaii defines as access and we strongly suggest that you use that. We think it's a better definition. When, at, when can a landlord have access to the unit and when can he not? And we thought the Hawaii law, we understand this was taken out of Nevada or Arizona, uh, but we felt it was too loose and left too much open uh, to interpretation. 
while the Hawaii law was pretty specific about when, and also abandonment, we're very concerned. You know, we have to have access uh, when it's abandoned. <laughs> And uh, some of the, it can be interpreted, if we don't know if it's abandoned, can we get in there or not? Um, and so Hawaii law pretty well defined that. Um, we asked that uh, you know, the, in the section of the law that said if the same thing breaks within six months, um, that the tenant uh, has the right to breach lease. Um, this is Guam. I hire an air conditioning mechanic to fix and it breaks in a three, four months. I mean, how, it's not fair to hold the landlord responsible when I send a duty, you know, a professional to take care of the problem and it's not to, you know, things break. And then you also get into definition when the air conditioner breaks, was it the capacitor, was it the condenser? It's, you know, uh, you know, so long as the landlord's trying to fix it, I would think that would suffice. Um, um, uh, the, uh, section A2 of uh, 48302, we ask that you consider removing the demand performance of the rental agreement by the landlord and if the tenant elects, obtain possession of the dwelling unit from the landlord. This has to do with, if I have a lease where the tenant is going to move in January 1st and I sign the lease and the old tenant doesn't move out, um, according to this law, the new tenant can march in, throw the old tenant out, and he has the right of entry into that unit. And it's not my fault that the old tenant didn't move out. That happens sometimes. It doesn't happen often, but it happens enough where, you know, are the current leases and the current law, the way the current leases are written is that there's a, usually a five-day gap where the landlord has to deliver within the five days, and if not, the tenant can cancel the lease and get everything back. I mean, that's all we can do as a landlord, you know. I, uh, if a tenant refuses to move, uh, it's happened a number of times where a tenant says, oh, my plane leaves next week, so I'm just going to stay here. And you go, but you can't, you know, at least the unit. And he goes, well, tough, that's your problem, I'm staying, you know. How do you get someone out? Um, we had a big concern with the self-help for minor defects, section 48303. That section allows a tenant to come in and fix if the, he feels the landlord didn't respond fast enough or fix things fast enough, the tenant can come in and fix it himself uh, uh, up to half the rent. So if the tenant's paying 3000 a month rent, he can go blow $1,500. And it, we feel this is going to lead to a lot of problems in lawsuits. Uh, did the tenant use his brother-in-law to fix it? Um, you know, you, you, you told me about it and, you know, I sent my guy three days later and you've already fixed it because you felt that wasn't fast enough. Um, we ask that you look at this section and it just doesn't seem fair to a landlord to give a tenant that kind of power to just unilaterally uh, use half the rent and do that. Um, um, we, we gave a suggested uh, section to add in there, um, um, there were some um, uh, wrong for failure to provide essential services. Again, uh, provided it's within landlord control was very important to us. Um, tenants remedy for landlord, I'm in 306, I'm going as fast as I can and I apologize. Landlord's unlawful ouster exclusion or diminution of services, uh, just some minor changes there, and to add that this section does not apply to fire or casualty damage caused by tenant. Um, this says if there's a fire, the tenant can walk out and cancel the lease. Well, the, the tenant starts the fire <laughs> just to get out of a lease. It sounds silly, but I'm telling you, it'll happen. <laughs> it'll happen. <laughs> um, um, the next uh, section, 48311, if the end of it, if substantially the same act or omission constitute prior, again, a six-month thing, um, if the same thing happens within six months, we ask that that be revisited. It just, so long as the landlord is trying, I'm hiring a professional to do the job. If they don't do their job, it just doesn't seem fair. Um, 
uh, failure to maintain. We ask that uh, um, um, that we change 14 days to five days. Um, almost every lease on Guam gives five day notice uh, uh, to tenant is because you got to give them 30 day notice. So you give them five day notice on lawful detainer and then 30 day, you want 14 then 30. I'm into my second or third month of a tenant not paying me rent before I can do anything. I've sent that, I've sent that section to you. Um, and then um, some, the holdover, um, we ask that you consider looking at uh, being able this two months rent and uh, attorney's fees. Um, um, that's a landlord can charge that. We feel that's not fair. All we want is our costs back. I don't want to have to be able to dig. If some tenants pay me five grand a month, that's saying I can charge them 10,000 plus legal fees and everything. That's, you know, may not be fair, you know. Um, uh, the treble damages, um, uh, I don't know. We Again, we felt that was unfair of a landlord to be able to collect that kind of amount. Um, Again, we were trying to be fair on both sides here. That's our main sections. I think if you look at, we have a lot of minor points that we've sent you already, but thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Felix. Is there anyone else that would like to share some concerns about the Bill 144? Maybe questions? Yes. Hello, my name is Greg Hartkoff. Um, I, uh, we have a couple of few different apartment buildings here. Um, one of them uh, is uh, Chamorro Garden Apartments, which is fairly nearby here. Um, generally, my partners and I, uh, you may know some of them, Roger Krauth Hamill or uh, Greg Kosenke. Um, we've looked at this and, and uh, generally we're, we're good with it. I mean, most of the sections we understand why you want to do this and, uh, you know, we're happy to see it. Um, I have a, you know, a one-page letter to give you with, again, some minor points, um, a lot of them similar to Chris's. I think uh, our, our one big question on this is that, is the section uh, 311, um, yeah, 311, where it talks about non-compliance for, for rent. Basically, someone doesn't pay you your rent. And the concern is that there is existing statute that we're basically all following, which as Chris says, it's five day notice and then you have to go to court and you have to get the, you know, marshal to come and evict and there's an existing process with an existing time frame. And this legislation doesn't repeal that or it doesn't amend it, it just is throwing in another uh, thing which now creates ambiguity and, and conflict in terms of what are we supposed to follow. And so one of the comments that one of my partners who's you know, he's a lawyer on Guam for many, many years and, you know, knows the process. You know, the existing statutes, they, they work. We, we all know how to, how to do the things right. Probably a lot of the issues are that people don't follow it. I mean, landlords just forcibly evict the tenant, you know, lock them out, do all the things that they're not supposed to do. But the existing statutes are clear about what's legal and what's not legal and they work. They're, they're fair, in our opinion, to both the tenant and the landlord, and that this uh, creates ambiguity by creating another statute that's in conflict with the existing one. The existing one, because it's been on the books for a long time, you know, there's been a lot of uh, case law that supports it, so, so our main point is with respect to uh, uh, evictions and, and, and all that, maybe look at the existing case law and certainly make sure this doesn't just conflict with it and create an issue for us. The rest of my comments uh, I'll submit in writing. We don't need to go over them. It's, you know, just okay. minor stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, yes, uh, when we, when we uh, wrote this bill, we, uh, we worked with our le legal department to ensure that, uh, you know, we address anything that would conflict with the existing law. But, of course, that's why we wanted the roundtable, because we were hearing um, other legal opinions and so I'm glad that you're here. Thank you so much for coming. Sure. And uh, we will definitely address this um, and to reflect an amended piece of the bill after we are done with this round table. So thank you, sir. Thank you, too. Is there anyone else? Yes. yes. Uh, my name is Chris Murphy. Thank you, Sander. Um, I'm here wearing two hats. Uh, one is um, I'm a member of 
Guam Association of Realtors, and I participated in uh, the group's uh, response to your initial bill. So as part of the, uh, the letter from GAR to you, uh, I was part of that input and fully agree with um, the items that uh, Mr. Felix indicated. And then I'm also chairman of the Guam Real Estate Commission, um, which is newly formed uh, in the sense that we're, we have an active body now. One of our major goals is to help rewrite the real estate laws in total of Guam. It's not just this law, it's all the laws are antiquated and need, need uh, revision and, and taken care of. So um, we're in favor of that. Um, we will be meeting next week as a commission and we will be taking the information that GAR provided you and we, the commission will be reviewing it and then submitting their um, support and or additional recommendations to your office. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Is there anyone else? Yes. Madam Chair, I'm Kathy Tychno. I work with uh, Guam Housing Urban Renewal. I'm their chief planner. Um, I do have one note. Uh, I noticed that um, under one section, uh, well, under the definitions, the rental agreement would be uh, any agreement written or not. Uh, and my concern is not with, um, not with the, the, you know, the licensed professionals, those who follow a code of ethics and those who have professional, um, the, the, those who, who exercise their professional integrity. My concern is simply um, that many of the tenants that we, uh, we, we deal with or we hear of, of um, Gura as the uh, provider of 2,500 tenant vouchers that, that um, are around the island, we're fortunate to be able to have, to fall back on um, a huge cache of federal rules and regulations that help govern fair play on that field. But the, the concern I have is the idea of using a non-written um, arrangement, if not, you know, for want of a better description, um, for folks that may not be um, savvy, tenants who are not savvy, and that, that um, without the ability to fall back on, an, on something that indicates what, the, what, those, what those, um, those terms were, that we might find ourselves with uh, our more vulnerable population, folks who are, are relying on their representation via the landlords or the managers, uh, of properties to give them guidance and at the end of the day they really will not have the wherewithal to protect themselves from the uh, the more dubious thank you miss Titan um, yes that's it's that's it I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're sharing your concern because that is that is something that we really want to uh, incorporate in this bill that we were looking to do you know is to really address you know to help the people so uh, we will look closely at that and ensure that um, we address this in a more clear format. We appreciate that and we'd love the opportunity to, to do a more detailed um, letter to you or some documentation to you okay. that kind of points out. Otherwise, there's some simple housekeeping, you know, laundry list like items that, you know, referencing and, and whatnot or recommendations for different definitions to be put in there that are referenced, you know, or sub-referenced like what constitutes a household? Um, it says tenant, a tenant is a tenant, a person who enters into the lease and who operates uh, under a household. But what, what is that household? Okay. I mean, we all should have, as, la as tenants or as owners, we, we want the opportunity to invite anybody we want into our house and provide it that they don't disrupt the quiet enjoyment of anyone else who's living there, you know, right. nearby. Um, we want that flexibility for the tenant. Okay, yes, we look forward to, to the letter, please. And, and perhaps we can even arrange a meeting together and, and sit down and talk it over. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, Ms. Miller. I, I, I have a little bit of a problem hearing you way down there, but I'm, I, I think your concern was for the individual tenants to, to know that the rental agreement was, as, as defined, a rental agreement would be written or not. It could be an oral agreement. And I, oh, I, right, right. Yeah, to speak to one question well, there. Well, I think, I think part of all of this is, is going to be part of marketing to, to everybody. You know, ideally have a little booklet signed once 
the Real Estate Commission, everybody gets together so that anybody can pick up the booklet and understand in plain English, you know, none of this, mm -hmm. but, you know, what their rights are, mm -hmm. you know? So whether they're dealing with a realtor or with an, just a homeowner, that they understand what wear and tear is, what, you know, all these terms that are a little foreign sometimes to an individual, what rights they have, you know, if the place is inhabitable. Those kind of things, right? I mean, it, it, that's it where it is in Hawaii, it's a booklet. You can pick it up anywhere that explains the landlord's rights and the tenant's rights, right? So that's your goal too, right? For the Real Estate Commission. And um, Chris was making another comment about all legal documents. I think federal law, Regulation Z of the Fair Housing Act calls for all real estate transactions to be in writing. So all leases are supposed to be in writing by law. I think this is just to cover those unscrupulous landlords that don't put things in writing just in case. But our but federal law clearly states it should be everything in has to be in writing. The best way to understand what you're going to bring to the table is the recipient and the the, the, the seller and the, the owner and the and the lease uh, the tenant are going to both sign at the end of the day. Right. One thing and, and you mentioned it, it's from the Fair Housing Act. One thing that Guam lacks is is um, uh, the equivalency, the local equivalency of fair housing law. And I think that's something that um, that is a great, this is a great start, just having that dialogue and, and starting that discussion. Um, Gora has the responsibility to act, uh, we, we occupy the job of doing fair housing coordinator. Um, so while everybody can go direct to U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to make their claims or make their statements of when they believe they've been, they've been, um, their fair housing rights are violated. We're dealing with, a, uh, on our end of the scale, our, our tenants uh, are those that may not have English as a first language. So a booklet in English is important, but I think also we would probably love to have the opportunity to translate that into other languages that are just as much a part of our bigger population. That's a good idea. Yep, definitely. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to address some concerns? Yes, yes, please, yeah, come, come over, and put your chair over here and, the, you, uh, just, just so everyone knows it's right, it's meant to be a free-flowing dialogue, right? We, we want to improve this bill, we want to work with the community to make this bill better and to the, for the best interest of the people of Guam. So Good please don't be, hes be hesitant to speak. Ryan de Guzman, Guam Association of Realtors. I just had two questions. The first question I had was, um, is the, the suggestions that GAR made um, to, the, to your office, is that gonna be made available to everyone? Um, okay, yes, so everybody they, has and, that. and they stated it earlier, what their suggestions were. Okay, and everybody yes. that submitted um, information also Yes, it will be part of a committee report, and the committee okay. report is open to the public for review. Okay, great. Yeah. And then the last question I had was, um, when you originally drafted your proposal, uh, who was involved in that process? Well, when we, it was a great idea that uh, my chief of staff and I had. Okay. And so uh, we did, you know, uh, an insurmountable amount of research. We've been working on it for like six months. And when we thought that it had some muster, we introduced it and we called everyone up that we knew and asked them, hey, can you please look at this bill? We want to know your input. And so that's where we are now. We, we've been receiving a lot of testimony uh, from you know, different uh, legal opinions, uh, different, different landlords, and so that's where we are now. Yes, yeah, sure. Can you introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, Mrs. Duenas, I apologize. L like I said, uh, 
it was just my, my chief of staff and I going by what we knew historically and looking at other laws nationally and internationally. Uh, it wasn't until after the bill was introduced, which is we, we sent notice out to every, you know the public that this bill was introduced. And then that's why we're having this roundtable hearing, because we want to make sure that no one, do, no one feels left out. Right? And so this is, this is the forum for you to address your concerns, you know, and, 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 and for us to meet. And I'm sorry I never met you, and I'm sorry perhaps we must have missed it, but it was not intentional to exclude anybody from it, which is why we're having this roundtable, because I want the public to know, I want everyone to know that this bill is here, and, you know, we'd like your input on how we can make it better for all parties concerned. Okay? Thank you. Is there anything else? Um, I was going to say, um, uh, Mr. Um, Murphy has, you know, your suggestions, our suggestions, and after his meeting, I mean, after we meet and after he comes up with his draft, maybe we can meet again, because I know there's some stuff that's missing, some items that probably should be included, right, that are not. So. Um, so he has all of ours. Can we just meet again at a later time once you present yours, right? Well, if, Mr. if, the, if you're acting as the Guam Real Estate Commission Chair, then uh, we're open to receiving your testimony for the bill. And uh, we'd like to have this in a public hearing at least by this month or, or next. And so that was the purpose of this roundtable, so everyone can come and bring in their recommendation. But of course, definitely, we want to hear what your concerns are. If you have your concerns now, then that's perfect. But uh, if you don't have it ready, then we'll... we'll, we'll yeah, as, a real, as a real estate commission, um, we've taken the information, but we're meeting next week. Okay. And, okay. and we weren't informed about, about any of this either, same as, as Liz. So um, we'd appreciate it in the future if if we can participate in this because we're, we're a group of professionals who have been doing real estate for many years right. and, and we're trying to rewrite all the laws anyway. So yes. working together, um, I think we can, we can do a lot of good things um, yes. if, we, if we do it systematically and, and keep everyone in the loop. Most definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yes, can you please introduce yourself? Good afternoon. My name is Jeanette Bocanegra. I am a former Army officer of 10 years. I just moved to Guam in January because my husband is still serving. So um, we came here from Texas and I have, I own two properties in Texas. And one of the first things that, that struck us here are the, um, the lack of, of a fundamental tenant and landlord bill. So I'm happy to see this happening here. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up today um, has to deal with um, vehicle abandonment or like junk cars on property or on the sides of the roads. We're fortunate enough that we can afford to live in a private community out in Dededo, but as soon as you leave our private gates, you see a lot of junk vehicles in the roads, in front of people's houses, abandoned, disabled, no tires, trees growing out of them, what have you. In Texas, um, for, for my tenants, the leases have, in, the, the leases that I've had, the, I've had attorneys incorporate um, specific clauses that talk about no more than three vehicles avail, um, allowed at one point in, you know, in the driveway, in the in the establishment, in the, in the home, right? Um, and obviously you want to keep the, the property looking clean and those junk cars, they really bring down the look of the neighborhood and they can become hazardous to a point. So I'd like to see something incorporated on behalf of the landlords, um, uh, this bill to enforce just cleaner neighborhoods, things like that when cars um, can be towed at the owner's expense um, and who's involved in that process because now I'm a news reporter for, for Pacific Daily News here and so that's one of the things I'm, I've been working on with governors and uh, as senators, I'm sorry, and GPD trying to get our areas cleaned up here in Guam. 
Um, also something that I'd like um, the bill to address are emotional support animals and service animals. I was deployed throughout my career in the Army and um, currently I have two emotional support animals that I brought here from Texas. When we moved here, our landlord was trying to, um, she, she wasn't aware of what an ESA animal was. You know, some people um, get them confused with what service animals are, and um, there has to be laws incorporated so that they're educated on what they can charge or not charge for pet deposits. Um, in the States, it's illegal. You, you, a, an emotional support animal or service animal cannot be charged whether you're at a hotel. There's no deposit that you can include. And um, she was trying to state otherwise, and so we had to get um, the people from housing at the military base involved to talk to her so that she understood um, the degree to which the animals are necessary for me. So um, something, you know, through no fault of her own, just, you know, Guam is a little behind the power curb is what I'm seeing. And so I just want to make sure that that's, that's clear um, to the landlords and that it's addressed also in this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your input and thank you for your service. Yes, uh, I'm, so, I'm smiling because, you know, uh, my chief of staff and I were aware of, you know, the emotional support, of, you know, that the animals bring for those that are suffering from PTSD and so forth. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, you know, we, we know people that use, you, you know, that their animals are a great help to them to, uh, for, you know, a calming factor addressing the, some of the challenges that they faced, you know, during wartime. So uh, I don't know why we didn't think of including that, but we'll definitely see what we can do to find a measure either in this bill or another bill to address just that, I, just Thank that uh, situation. Yes. Senator, I was going through the bills of the 34th, and I believe you guys actually have one that made law that has to do with support, uh, excuse me, it might have to do with um, um, service animals, service service animals. Yes. But there are a That's couple right. of other categories that we address too. And right, it's not specific. Yeah, yeah, she's absolutely correct. We don't, no, they are not pets by definition. They're doing, a, they're doing, they do a job, you know, whether it's a formal one and they've been trained for or if it's simply one that alleviates whatever um, conditions or situations the, you know, the owner has in their, you know, to deal with but um, we can provide you some guidance as well. Excuse me. Thank you, Ms. Uh, yes, Mr. Mr. Servino, I believe, came and talked to us at length, as part of housing, I mean, part of fair housing, ADA, right? And, and they are trying to specify especially what is a service animal and an emotionally, uh, an emotional support animal, because it's been extremely abused also, you know? You can just go on the internet and say, my dog is an emotion, you know, and they, you get a certificate and it's signed off as a, an, you know, somebody. So, um, so I know he's working on that. So, so that it, you know, not, people don't take advantage. And so it works both ways. So he, he is working on that. Okay. So I, I think I, what I'm trying to say is I'm not sure it has to be part of the landlord tenant code. It can be a reference to the ADA um, law. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there anything else? Um, yes, sir. P please come forward and go ahead and. Okay, all right. My name is Thomas Hutchlitz, and I'm representing myself, basically. But I do have a question since she brought it up, and essentially is, what are the rights for landlords, and uh, not only landlords, or, uh, when you have neighboring landlords who are absent, they don't live on the island anymore, and leave their property alone, and everything is overgrown, and then inf um, inflicting damage to my property. That needs to be addressed too, because right now I don't see any any situation on Guam where somebody is doing anything about it. Uh, we have, for instance, the, the so-called beautification, and there are people who are well known on the island, 
They leave their property alone right when, on, on Marine Drive where people drive by uh, tourists and the property is in total shame uh, uh, and shambles. Uh, overgrown vegetation and it puts a big deal off cutting um, grass and so on. Uh. I mean, we need to do something about that and I think that's part of your, your um, problem as well. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, sir. Is there anyone else? Anyone? Okay. All right, very good. I'd like to thank all of you for, for uh, speaking today in regards to bill number 144. Um, and thank you for taking your time to read the bill and also provide us uh, recommendations on how can we can improve this bill. Uh, this bill is very fundamental uh, to our community and I definitely want to work with everyone in our community so that we meet a happy medium for all parties involved and that everyone's rights are protected. Um, I don't want this bill to be partial where it's pro-tenant or it's pro-landlord. I, I would like to have this bill as, as a, you know, as a baseline, a happy medium for all parties to benefit. And, and that, that's why we ha we're having this roundtable hearing today to give the community an opportunity and all those like uh, Ms. Duenas that felt that they were not aware of it, that we didn't do the proper uh, due diligence. So thank you for coming and sharing that with us. And, um, and please send us your recommendations and your concerns. Um, if you'd like, we can send an email and, and we can add it as part of the committee report. Um, and perhaps we can also meet uh, to, to speak with you about some of the concerns on this bill. Uh, so, and thank you uh, for all of, your, all of you for your, your expertise in sharing the knowledge that you have uh, with some of the challenges that our tenants face um, and also some of the laws that we can improve on our island. So thank you very much. The next uh, bill we will go into, if there's no one else that would like to speak on Bill 144. Anyone? The next bill that we will go into is Bill 145. Okay. Bill 145 is an act to repeal subsection 41004A4 and A5 of Article 10, Chapter 4, Title 12, and to repeal and reenact subsection 20101 of Chapter 20, Title 11 of Guam Code Annotated relative to removing the requirement that the Guam Housing Corporation appropriate a sum certain from its revenues to ensure a reserve balance every fiscal year and to authorizing fees imposed on the sale and transfer of interest on real property to be deposited into the Housing Trust Fund Program. Now the Housing Trust Fund Program um, is operated by Guam Housing Corporation and um, you know during the budget process this year because I'm new, I, Guam Housing Corporation is not uh, in our government's budget as far as appropriation. And so uh, this, is a, this is an opportunity for us to, to see what we can do to fund this housing trust fund. And perhaps some people um, may feel that uh, it singles out uh, certain uh, groups. But however, uh, we have seen the, um, the possibilities with the uh, Speaker Juan Pat's uh, law of the escheated funds. We've seen how we took $2.9 million in this cheated funds and turned it around to a multi-million dollar economic stimulus uh, program. It, it built homes, it gave people jobs, it, it produced um, uh, uh, taxes for housing instead of property just sitting there. Um, it produced uh, infrastructure for power and water. And so all of these things we'd like to really take into consideration to to uh, expand um, what housing, the housing trust fund. And um, it's very essential, I feel, to, to our island because this is going directly to the people. Uh, this, is, this is an economic stimulus program that goes back into the people, back into their investment. And so uh, I invited uh, Mr. Beaver here today to, to give a, a presentation of this, this bill um, on the housing trust fund. And um, I'll just turn it over to you, sir, if, if you'd like. A, um. Okay, so go ahead. I, first of all, Senator, thank you for um, introducing this bill, and also thank you for your due diligence to uh, conduct a roundtable uh, prior to a public hearing so that uh, the public can be informed uh, of your efforts and our efforts uh, together to try to find an opportunity to continue the good work of Guam Housing 
and to expand the services that we're currently providing. Obviously, uh, this is not a novel idea. Uh, it's been introduced over the years uh, by other senators. It's been heard, and uh, we feel it's important to hear it again, and we hope that we can see through to its passage. Um, I wanted to mention and thank you once again also for the creation of your uh, working group in Afagumamami. And uh, I know that our friends and, and associates on, on the Guam Association of Realtors, as well as others who were present, um, it was noted at that meeting a number of uh, at least uh, one banker and president and other members uh, uh, recommended this program as well and saw fit that it was uh, fundamental to uh, the change that can be brought about uh, through something, uh, programs such as this. So we just wanted to mention that um, there's been a lot of dialogue. We'll continue to dialogue, and so we thank you for the opportunity. Um, I think, Clyde, if you'd like to, you can just read that into the record. Sure. And uh, uh, once again, thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Munya, for being here, and also Senator Tulagi. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Beaver? Yeah, thank you, Senator, for having us down here tonight, or this afternoon. A little bit about the Housing Trust Fund. Everybody probably knows, probably knows what it is. But anyway, we at Guam Housing Corporation recognize that we have many new leaders that may not be aware of what the Housing Trust Fund program is. Or perhaps we, we may only need to be updated a little bit. We thought it may be in order to provide a little history behind this drive. The Housing Trust Fund program is not a new concept. It functions in supplement for housing needs in support of housing problems identified by the Fair Housing Act of 1968, as HUD, but is administered locally. The Fair Housing Act was initiated in 1966, but it would lay dormant until the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which, in which created the Fair Housing Act. The Housing Trust Fund project was first established as far back as 1972 to but really didn't get blossomed out until about 1986, 14 years later. Even here today, we find that Gura cannot solve all of Guam Housing's problems. It is clear there's a need to supplement their programs. Guam Housing Corporation has been working to initiate this concept here since around 1998, with the first attempt being the first first-time homeowner assistance program. However, it was short-lived as the funding source dried up after only six months. The funding for this program was made available through the general fund, and it demonstrated in short order that it was not sustainable. This GHC initiated program laid dormant for the next 14 years, where it was reintroduced through the Housing Trust Fund Act of January, 19, January 2012. Again, with the initial funding source as funded by GHC was exhausted in less than six months. Through the introduction of exceeded funds, the program has continued but the funding remains limited. It is clear by the success of this program, the Housing Trust Fund Initiative has recognized that there is a need to support the accessibility and affordability of housing and a resident for the residents of Guam. The positive economic impact of the housing market with only the single program so far has brought an estimated $130,154,776 in real estate, banking, escrow, appraisals, title activity, not to mention the trickle-down trickle down, trickle down, trickle down effect, I'm sorry, while placing over 583 families in homes. So far, we have dispersed between 1998 and then through the, the current programs, $3.7 million to first-time homeowners. There are so many other problems that go well beyond first-time homeowner assistance as addressed in the house housing trust fund administrative rules. We have home ownership programs. We have rental assistance programs. We have utility hookup programs, housing mitigation programs, property renovation programs, homeless programs, retrofit for ADA compliant programs, emergency shelters, housing solutions for elderly, property acquisition programs, new construction programs, nonprofit or charitable housing programs, special lending or loan programs, short-term loan programs, or any other program that the legislature deems appropriate and as legislated. Guam is economically well served, yet we have families who cannot financially afford a safe, secure place to live. Everyone should have the opportunity to fair housing. You cannot purchase a, or even rent a safe house when some of the wages people earn. Wages across the country are similar for similar work, but the cost of housing is not. Here it is exorbitantly high. 
Guam, is, as the rest of our great country has understood for a long time, cannot, re cannot rely on federal programs to sustain our local housing programs. We need to establish a continued revenue source to support our lower income families. Yes, we are seeking an, an uptick in the transfer fees, but unlike the entire rest of the country, we are looking at only the high-end properties, those that are $1 million and greater, whereas the increase is merely nominal. Based on our research, approximately 95% of all transfers will not even be affected by this act. Guam really needs this program and, of course, this bill, as it does address a more permanent funding source to help solve many of Guam's housing problems. It is not merely another short-term fix. The funding provided in this bill would not only allow the first-time homeowner assistance program to continue, but it would also provide a mechanism for funding other much-needed housing programs. Furthermore, it is important to recognize that unlike federal programs, housing trust funds are locally established, locally funded, and locally administered, and targeted towards solving local concerns while reporting to and accountable to local authority, thus eliminating and reducing federal requirements or concerns. Now, this program, I keep reiterating the fact, it's been around for 50 years. It's been, obviously been successful. We need to do something. The, the number of the houses, the people we put in houses, I got pages and pages and pages of these things here. The, trip, the, the, the economic benefit here, these figures are estimates. Basically, $93 million in real estate transactions has occurred because of this one program we've got in place right now. We've got real estate commissions, we've got appraisal fees, you've got title insurance fees, you've got escrow fees, you've got loan fees, you've got hazard insurance fees, you've got property taxes, you've got interest rate on loans utilities, GRT, for, of course, then you got to, to, to fill the houses with furniture. It's just on and on and on and on. Now, these 583 families would not have been there without this one program. These are school teachers, fire departments, cops. The real estate activity over, over a six year study that I did In, in, in the very second to the very final page now is that special spreadsheet I got out there. That one. Over, over this six year period here, 3,200 properties transferred at $1.9 billion. 3,058 were below a million. 151 was over a million. $1.2 billion, over a million dollars, transferred. These programs would bring in an average of $2 million a year for housing trust fund programs. That's all it would be. Now, we started out, as you all well know, we started asking for the sky. We are asking for 1.15%. Land management is asking for a little bit. So we, we're compromising with those folks. They, they, they're getting a quarter of a percent for everything that goes out there. They wanted to go up to 0.35% to over for those over the million dollars. That gets them $1.2 million a year on, on average was to operate. So which we'd increase about 250,000 bucks a year. For us, for the housing programs, about $2 million. Judy Wanpat, Speaker Wanpat came out with the Housing First program here back in December, and we can't do anything with it because it's, it's not funded. You give us a year to put it together, and we're still trying to put it together, but it's not funded. This would help fund that. Thank you. But, I mean, if, if I can to, just make yes, a final yes, comment. Yes. Appreciate it. I mean, we're, we're here often. And so I just want to, I, well, I think this is important for the record before we, you know, go on with the rest of the dialogue. As you mentioned, Madam Chair, we are not part of the budget uh, for the, uh, for the general fund. We just passed our budget uh, with 100% board approval. Not one dime, with the except, exception of administrative fees, will go to Guam Housing for this program. Every penny will go back to the community and will go back into the real estate economy and what's generated through that. Not one employee will be hired. Not one insurance program will be subsidized. We are completely subsidized by the corpus that we have at Guam Housing, which is basically uh, our portfolio. 
We live within that budget. We operate within that budget. If we are unable to deal with our budget, then we have to cut. If we have additional revenue through that, then that's what we use to reinvest into Guam housing, our properties, and other things that we manage. So I wanted to make it abundantly clear so that the people that are listening as we go forward to discuss this, this will in no way, shape, or form grow Guam housing with regard to staffing pattern or any sort of benefits that exist with our employees. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. President. Ms. Miller? Do you Thank you. I, first, I want to say you don't have to tell us how awesome, they, what an awesome job you guys do. And you know, I mean, we, we know it, we take advantage of it, you know, for our buyers, definitely. And you, you weren't here, but we sat with Mr. Benevente for a long time, and we were instrumental in getting that, those initial funds, you know, the cheap funds from the, you know, and we were trying to get you other funds from the escrow company. So we don't have any problem. We know we do, you do a great job, yeah? We are just question the source of the funds that you're wanting. Um, yeah, it, it, we, all we ask is that you talk to escrow companies um, and, and, and maybe some attorneys who handle real estate about how this increasing these recording fees, how that will infect, affect investors. Um, that's our problem. That was our problem when it was first brought up. We brought up alternative uh, suggestions, such as the 4% gross receipt tax on federal programs, products. There's hundreds and, I mean, there's hundreds of millions of dollars not being charged the 4% that should be and, and could very easily be. We, we laid out solutions on how to do that. You can hire somebody to collect that. We've also laid out to the senator the system development charge of $9 million that is sitting in a bank and has not been used by Guam Water Authority and is just sitting there dead money. Um, why not access those funds? Um, it's there. You know, I mean, we've, we're totally with you. We're just asking you to look at other sources and, and look at some of the ideas we've said and to please talk to some of the other professionals about how this recording, increase in recording fee will affect. Thanks, Mr. Felix, and you're, and you're absolutely right. But one thing is I've studied this program for over 40 years, and this, there are several different funding sources that you can tap into. This one here is so prominent, and it's, it, it is, it's something that every state is charging on every transaction, not just, we put a floor at a million dollars because of what you guys asked for. But the point is, is that, Every state is going at 100 percent of every transfer. We're not going to do that. So we reduced all the way down. We started out at 500,000. You folks thought that wasn't high enough, so we went to a million dollars. So the, 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 the thing is, is how would it affect in investors? I don't know. But the thing is, is that this program is not a new concept. If we didn't bring it up yesterday or last year or last month, it's been in place for a, I've used it since 1986. So See, that's what scares me is you're saying, I don't know how this is going to affect investors. No. Well, the but point, by just by saying that, you're saying you don't seem to care. Well, we do that, care. That we, that's what we, runs we, this island. We, we do care. That's why we're here right now. We do care. That's why we're here right now. But the point is, is that it's, it is something that's not new. And even on your, on your real estate closing documents, there's a line right there print in print of every document out there, real estate transfer fee. So it's always, it's already, it's, it's been in use so long, it's, it's just second nature. It's there. So. We're, t we're trying to tap in. We, we tap into sheet of funds. We've talked about it long before, we, long before you did. We talked about a lot of other sources of funds, but they're all of them tied to something else. We wanted to, to do something here for the local folks. The price of housing out here is high. You've got to admit that. You know that. Go to Kansas City, get a job at Kmart, you can afford to buy a house. Here you cannot. So it's time to do something. Again, we're with you all the well, way. We're definitely with you. Definitely with you. Well, you know, and by the same token, Kansas City, there's probably not that many transactions over a million. So some states can do this because, you know, they do for but we're at the top of the bar along with, you know, expensive places and places where there's investors. So that's, that's our concern. I mean, we're willing to sit down and figure out whatever is necessary because I know that it's a very vital part 
of, of Guam to help with, with these people that they can't afford. They're getting totally priced out of the market. I know that. It has to be sustainable. That's the whole yes, thing exactly. here. It has to be sustainable. I so. agree. We agree. I, again, my apologies. Maybe I have a yeah. university meeting. We're just asking that it please be and we're some asking other you, way. We're asking for you to, to, to give us a little bit more here. We started out at 1.75% for 100% of transactions. I, I mean, I'm sure we can thank, all sit thank down you. and talk, but... Thank the, you, Ms. Miller. Um, I'm sorry. We could just, you know, uh, I, I it's know. getting a little heated okay, here. No so. problem. <laughs> okay. No, I just wanted to say a few things. It's kind of like a Robin Hood program, isn't it? No, it's not. Well, yes, it is. It's taking from the rich and so it's giving to the poor. But, but why 1150? Why not 50 dollars? Why not 100 dollars? No, no. I, I'm just saying, it used to be this much, which it was. Yeah, for 990 thousand, it was 2,475. Now it's 11,500. It keeps going up. When does it stop? No. We started asking for 1.75 percent. Now we're down to 1.15 percent, and and, and 0.35 of that goes to land management. They're getting 2.25 already. But so with, with, uh, again, what we're trying to I do. Mean, you know, it's just taxing. You know, you could just keep raising the it, taxes yes, so it, you could fund government tax. programs. I I like the program. Is there a stipulation when you when you give first-time home buyers the grant? If they sell the property. Is there something that goes back? Yeah. Is there? There's is there? Year, there's a five-year recapture clause. Yeah. So yeah. they have to pay it back. Yeah. How, how do that? How does that happen? Well, I, we haven't had it happen yet, but that's there, there, there is a recapture in those things right there. If they, if they sell the property. Well, why do you have to have a five-year recapture? I, I, why don't you just, you know, they got a person got this much money to buy his first home. If he sells the home, yeah. presumably for a higher higher value, there should be an obligation to pay that back so that other people could benefit from the program. It becomes a, somewhat of a revolving fund. Yeah. I mean, but why don't you put that into the bill? I mean, you know, uh, Chris mentioned a, a bunch of potential sources. I mean, those are sources that are a lot more lucrative than what you're proposing. And he is right. You really have to look at what happens to investment. I know, and the GRT goes to government. That's the thing. GRD is given money. So. Well, you could put a stipulation that yeah. a portion of that goes to, and, and if you do establish a, a true revolving fund, then really maybe we, the only thing that you can look at is then. We have other programs to put in place, not just this one program, but mm -hmm. other things. We, again, one of the government's big initiatives right now is the homeless program. So those are things that we try to look at more than just one. Mm -hmm. You want to go to the go to the you go to a lot of states' websites, Washington State's a good one, and you go down there, you just find thousands of programs that are funded by the Housing Trust Fund, and exactly that. But every, go on your computer and type in Housing Trust Fund, you'll be inundated with information. I started out in 1998 with just a book, just a little booklet. But now, go on your computer and type it in. You will find how these programs are doing so much good. And the point is, is that the Fed's no, 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 kids, I don't think I don't think anybody's arguing about to, the good that it does. But we need it's to just find a, it. at what price do you pay to do that good? And the price is perhaps a damper on investment. A lot of your primary real estate that we're looking at here is sold by off island investors anyway. A lot of them don't even stay here. So that's another thing. But maybe they won't do that deal if you if they see the the obstacles that yeah. are involved. I mean yeah, what Chris is saying, maybe you should look at what or talk to the escrow companies, find out what the impact is. Maybe it won't be 1150, maybe it'd be a little less. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. why 1150? Why not 50? Why not nine, $9? I mean, I'm just saying there should be something to back up that figure. And that back up that figure has to take into account a lot of other factors. Mm -hmm. so, so if I can address that one, because I, I, I know Clyde, you're probably <laughs> the exchange, but it, that's why we did the breakdown here in terms of what the actual impact on the 4.71 in the overall transaction, the historical data. Now, I, I don't, I, I disagree on the Robin Hood comment. I think this is a cost of doing business. That's why we modeled the program after it's not novel, it's done in other jurisdictions. It's a cost of doing business that other 
individuals that are doing transactions understand. I, 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 Chris, ha just the I, fact I have a hard that, time seeing The fact that other jurisdictions do it isn't justification for us to do it. I'm just saying a little more thought should go into Puerto Rico does it. Yeah. Brooklyn Islands do it. I mean, everybody else does it. Yeah. Every, yeah, what, where's Puerto Rico now? But the point is, is that every, country, every state's doing it. There must be something good about it. There must be something good about it. My, my point on well, saying, I don't know. It didn't yeah. do Puerto Rico a lot of good. Yeah. I, I think if we start using examples whereby there are multiple factors to how individual economies are affected, I'm not sure that that's going to get us anywhere. If we stay on this particular program and the work that it does within housing programs that are locally chartered, I think then we continue down the road of having a fruitful discussion. Now, now. I have no problem with continuing to loop back, and I'm sure the chairwoman and other senators are, are going to want to talk to all sectors of business. That's how we arrived here at a, at, at a very middle road proposal from what was put together forward. I've had to, to, to work on this project now for four years, and when it was first put in at 17.5, 1.75%, of course, it was when you did the equation, it, I thought myself, understanding a little bit of real estate, I don't do the big transactions that most of you do, but I do the ones in the area of, 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 of where it would have been affected, and that's where I had made the recommendation. We made the recommendation together to go to a million dollars. But, but on these commercial transactions and others in the multi-millions, I'm having a hard time, and I will work with the brokers, and we'll see what they have to say, but I'm having a hard time realizing that those transactions will be deal breakers in the kind of multi-millions that are being talked about transaction, transactions and the money that's changing hands. So, uh, you know, it's, it's on the floor. We'll talk to the brokers once again. We'll continue the dialogue. Um, you know, the, the good thing about the trust fund is that it can, there can be a multitude of funding sources to it if that's, if that's the road we want to go down and working together as a committee. Um, you know, the 4% taxing on federal dollars and projects that's going on uh, outside of GRT, I'm not sure about that. I, I think everybody doing business on Guam has to pay their GRT. But we would look at that. And if that was the case, Madam Chair, I'm sure, uh, you know, that, that's something we could look at. As Clyde said, the sustainability of this program is very important. And, 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 and that's why we saw that a, as a normal course of business and a cost of doing business that's associated with recordation fears, at Department of Land Management, once again, not being novel, I'm sure that's exactly why other jurisdictions have done it, to make sure that they have a consistent funding source for the programs that they put out there to support. And, 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 and I think we've demonstrated, and thank you for continuing to appreciate it, that the multiplier on these programs is, is so significant. There is no government investment right now. I would challenge the research to show any government program or any fee that actually generates the kind of revenue that this fee generates by allowing individuals who have barriers to buying homes, to securing a home, simple down payment or other assistance to get them into that home and to make that real estate transaction happen. I, I, I do not see another government investment or a tax dollar or a fee that generates anything within the nature and also that turns that money back into the same industry from whence it came. Every dollar goes back right into real estate. I would challenge the chairwoman and any other committee going forward that has the oversight on finance, bring Quam Housing down every year to show their budget and to show that they have no employment, no growth, no vehicles purchased, no operational funds with the exception of having administrative fees, which is normal for a person to have to take on this responsibility to manage the applications and to manage working with the banks and the realtors to see it through. Aside from that, absolutely no growth in government, 100% revolving funds straight back into the private sector. I don't know any government program right now that exists that does that. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on Bill 145? Mr. Borja, thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman and Senators. My name is Michael Borja. 
I am the director of the Department of Land Management. My apologies for coming in a little late. I had a conflict in schedule with another meeting. Um, I'm glad I came in on this portion of the, the discussion on Bill Number 145. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that what we found in the Department of Land Management, we looked at the numbers, and there are two aspects that this bill would affect, not only the Department of Land Management on the fee schedule, but also the Chamorro Land Trust Commission. Um, for the Chamorro Land Trust Commission, it's really our lessees who stand to benefit from this, from the proposal to raise the fees to provide money to the housing trust. It's the only source of them for them to be able to get any kind of funding for, for financing a Chamorro Land Trust leased uh, lot for a home to be built on other than, other than VA. If they're not VA qualified, then they, this, this is the, the, the avenue of last resort because most um, uh, lending institutions do not provide uh, any borrow, any, any, they don't give to a borrower who they can't put a lien on the land or mortgage the land and by law they cannot mortgage, mortgage the Chamorro Land Trust lands. Um, when we looked at the numbers of the documents that had been processed through the Department of Land Management in a, in a sampling, uh, we saw that for the transactions under $1 million, 93% of the transactions fell in that category. It was, and I don't know if this was addressed earlier, and 7% of those transactions fell above $1 million. However, the converse is true when you look at the value of, of uh, real estate that was done. So that 7% actually generated 70% of the um, amount of sales that were actually conducted. And, and so the monies that it would increase uh, in, if you did the formulas for Department of Land Management, we would really only see for the Land Survey Revolving Fund just a, an 11% increase in, for the Department of Land Management. However, the monies that went into the Housing Trust, like I said, there's a direct correlation of that money to the Chamorro Land Trust lessees. And so that is a benefit for us as far as the Chamorro Land Trust Commission goes as well, is because you know, we do have to look at trying to build subdivisions um, and engaging in that process. And, and if the current trust amounts of money in the trust, let's say can only generate enough at a, at a hypothetical 20 homes uh, to be financed per year, and I'm trying to do 130 unit subdivision, uh, we wouldn't be able to get it off the ground because the financing wouldn't be there for the individuals to be able to finance the homes that will be built uh, by in the, through this subdivision unless the developer is able to do, to do the financing themselves. So I just, that's pretty much the amount of information I wanted to, to share with you today on, on this. So we do support this bill um, in, in its aspects because uh, we see that there is a plus for two sides. I mean, not so much in the Land Survey Revolving Fund for the Department of Land Management, but the follow through into our clients in the Chamorro Land Trust Commission. Thank you, Mr. Borrell. Vice Speaker, did you have any questions? Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Borrell, when you said uh, you gave a percentage as to how your, I think your survey fund would increase, did that equate to $1.2 million? Is that what you're estimating? Because we were given that kind of number earlier, and you're giving us a percentage. Um, yeah, there should be a table. I don't All know right. if you gave a table, but. Yeah, just let me know. What, um, and I wanted to ask the. 1.3 million. OK. And I wanted to just ask yeah, the realtors who are here and um, brokers. When Mr. Felix said we should um, ask the experts how this will affect investors, who do, would you recommend be included in that uh, discussion? Who, who are the experts in that to determine how this will affect investors? I think you mentioned uh, that you should company. talk to the escrow company. Okay. You should also talk to Gita, okay. some of the, the officials at Gita, and perhaps uh, Chamber of Commerce. I mean, you know, there are a lot of uh, resources out there 
that have uh, some sort of a relationship with investment. But actually, I wanted to, to say something. It's not going to go over big. It's going to go over like a lead balloon. You really should take a look at that Chamorro Land Trust, the entire Chamorro Land Trust. Because if, if you lease a piece of property for a dollar a year for 99 years, you get nothing back. If you could somehow find a way to get that property to the person that starts up perhaps leasing it to owning it, he pays property taxes. I think, in my own opinion, and I've looked at this for a long time, I was at Public Works for a long time, I looked at all the issues that Tomorrow Land Trust has, has had, no infrastructure, um, no building code uh, uh, requirements and force there, um, that um, it's really the biggest obstacle to a very healthy real estate economy because it's basically a giveaway, but it's really not a giveaway. It has a string on it. The property is out there for people to use for 99 years, but after 99 years, they can't mortgage it. They can't, they can't get any, any monies to build anything. Um, but if you find some kind of mechanism, look at the law, find some kind of mechanism to get that property to private property ownership, I think the returns are going to be awesome. I mean, I, that's my own opinion. Just, yeah, I'd just like, one I'd like to, I'd like to. clarification. There, there is taxes on the improvements. And so when, the, when, when there is a home that's put on that property, that Chamorro Land Trust owner now becomes a taxpayer. And there is taxes on the land. I'd, I'd like to say something just as an ex-banker and a developer. Um, with regards to what you indicate about the Chamorro Land Trust, there's an, a tremendous opportunity to help affordable housing and encourage affordable housing opportunities if the Chamorro Land Trust program was revamped. And I understand, being a banker, that um, you know the first the first goal is to provide local families with the opportunity to to own properties. But until you get out there and allow private developers to put in the infrastructure and develop the property, which government cannot do, will never do. Um, they'll never be able to afford it, but private developers can if they're able to uh, make a decent return on it. So if you revamp the program to allow um, banks to provide mortgages to Chamorros first and then figure out some, some system whereas um, if that Chamorro family for whatever reason loses the property that you don't limit it to another Chamorro family having to take over the property and you open that up to the, the general marketplace, you, you don't lose anything because it's still leasehold property. So the government never loses the property, it just has a different person residing in that property and by doing that you would, you would provide numerous opportunities for housing, um, affordable housing that, that would be funded totally, totally by private money. Right, and that's what we are already are looking at. I can't speak outside the bounds of the current laws on, on the leasing aspects of the Chamorro Land Trust Commission, but like I said earlier, we already have a, a, a process that we're working into place to do a 130 unit affordable housing subdivision and it would be developed by a private developer. Our original estimates were at $25,000 per unit for the infrastructure costs. And we recently had a developer come before the Land Use Commission for their subdivision, a rather large subdivision, and their estimate was $20,000 per, per house lot for the infrastructure development. We're talking the full infrastructure, including sewer. You're right. That's, that is the way to get the infrastructure into place. But like I said before, when it comes down to the financing of those affordable homes for these individuals, unless the developer is able to provide the financing themselves, going through the traditional lending institutions is, is, is not an option for many of them. And this housing trust is the source to try and help in, in that aspect to get it going because I don't think it would be wise for any developer to take on a task to try and build 130 affordable housings with all the 
infrastructure if the potential buyers couldn't borrow? I'd like to get back to the bill. Yes. Um, the uh, um, Guam Housing has said that um, this type of fee is, is common in other jurisdictions, and my quick research indicated the same thing. Do you object to that finding? That the, that the fees in other jurisdictions for document uh, transactions are higher in other jurisdictions than they are in Guam right now? I'm John Duane from the Guam Association of Realtors. Uh, I don't know, but I don't think that should be justification to implement it, just because other jurisdictions have it. I think we should have our own justification. Well, I think that's just part of the findings that we're going to consider, so I just wanted to know if there was well, any other, other research otherwise, because, yeah, otherwise. Well, but that shouldn't be a justification, the fact that other jurisdictions and many other jurisdictions have it. I mean, there, there are a lot of states out there with income tax laws. Should we follow? I mean, I'm just saying that's not a justification. No, I, I agree. I'm not saying that it's the sole justification. I'm saying it's the one that's being used today in this hearing, so I want to know if there's anything on the other side of that justification. Okay. What about, um, I also wanted to check with Guam Housing. When you said, you said um, if this bill is passed, that you are going to operate independently, there would be no increase in employees, things like this, but, uh, but the bill also um, repeals, repeals the money that's currently being reserved. We don't have the money to reserve it. That's been, that's been the big thing right there. The law put into place that we reserve, the first is out of half a million dollars, and we got it changed down, try to get it removed out entirely, but it was reduced down to 250. Well, we put 500,000 up, late Senator Ben, back in 2012. Mm -hmm. And he says, we will look for other sources of funds beyond that. He thought we was financially fluid. Well, we've got three and a half million dollars in so far. Of course, that's how much we've been put in there so far. But we're still supposed to reserve $250,000. That's an unfunded mandate. We can't do it. So it's not there. And, and Madam Chair, or uh, Senator, for the purposes of the reserve, and I will tell you what exists right now, the real estate companies are very aware of this, and GAR is very aware of this. The number of issuances for the first time homeowners is 497, the amount, three point, uh, almost $3.8 million. Dispersed is 438. There is, and, 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 and so if you look at even the disparity that exists right now, we are currently keeping the pipeline open because as the cheated fund comes in, we take care of those. So the fact of the matter is there is no reserve at this point. But to, to, to Clyde's point, this is for the purposes of funding these programs under the first-time homeowners. This does nothing for salaries and benefits for our employees, doesn't pay for gas, doesn't pay for our rent, doesn't pay for anything. You that, mean the bill? We, excuse me? The bill? No, we, in terms of what the we do with this money. The fund. Absolutely, right, Senator. Right, that yes. goes absolutely directly and straight into this So you're program. saying the fund is no longer funded by this, uh, this part of the statute that you want to repeal, and it's only funded by escheated funds? That's correct. Okay. It was taken over by the trust fund when the trust fund rules and regs were adopted. All right. That's what I wanted to clarify. Yeah. Um, those are my questions for now, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um. Yes, Senator. I do want to make a, a comment. Um, again, uh, I just want to reiterate the fact that I, I, I agree with Guam Housing Corporation um, that this program is essential. It's needed, and it helps uh, many, many people. Um, I think any increase, especially in this juncture in time with the market, I think it's going to cause a negative uh, effect. Uh, I think with this particular bill, it singles out a particular party, and it's not, it's not, it's not fair. It's not, um, it's partial to, to people that are, even if, you know, they're paying more. Um, so to me, that, that's a concern. Um, again, any, 
any increase is not going to be received well. We understand that. I think we need to explore other sources, and I think most especially that was uh, mentioned earlier was the Guam uh, Land Trust. Um, do we have an inventory right now? That's a question I have. Do we have an inventory of all the the property for Guam? Guam, uh, and um, is there a possibility that that could be leased out and and that money be used? to help fund this program? No. As it was pointed out, the, the annual rent for 99 years is only $1. There's, there's no possibility. In fact, I had legislation uh, passed into law about two years ago that would require the lessee to pay the full amount within a year of their lease because at year number 98, to collect $1 is going to probably cost them $45 to do so. So it would be grossly inefficient. So we've moved in just at least on that step. It's not so we can gain revenue so that we don't have to make our job more expensive moving on down the life of that lease. Um, but through the property taxes, and I guess as Senator Duenas said, you know, it's, they will pay property taxes after, this, after seven years of the lease unless the government uh, surveys the property for them. Then they're responsible for the, prop the land property taxes immediately. But any, any leasehold improvements or any buildings that are put onto that property, they're subject to those taxes as well. So as soon as they put on some home on there, then there are property taxes that are going to be assessed on those properties also. And they can't, they can't put homes on there because there's no infrastructure, correct? And there's That's no, correct. Discussed. And, and just to point out that this bill addresses the 13 programs that uh, Guam Housing Corporation um, utilizes, and one of them is utilities. So, I mean, we, we, and we see directly the impact where it's going into, back into the real estate economy, back for the people of Guam, and we are in dire need of something that helps with our utilities and our homeless programs, um, home ownership. So, this is the reason why that's, um, I'm hoping that we can come to a common ground and, and, and do something about this. Um, Yes, Ms. Duenas. Which, can you please come back uh, up to the microphone so we can hear? I think we all agree it's a great program and we've helped many of these buyers, but I think we can't come to the table every so often when the funds run out. So if there is something that will run with the title, if they're in agreement to get these free funds, nothing in this world is free. So if there's a way that led, something could be written in where if I took advantage of the, these funds, I have to give back somehow. And if it could be recorded in the deed where if I ever sold it, parts of that monies go back to keep replenishing the funds. Because, I mean, if I stay in the home for the next 30 years and I pass it on to my grandkids, no problem. But if I sell it, then you, we can't keep coming to the legislators to say, hey, we're out of money. You've got to figure something out to have it revolve and work on having it run with the title so that if they sell it, that amount of money is given back. Yeah. Ms. Duenas and, and, and to other guard members that I've speak, spoken to offline about this as well, in other committee meetings that we had, and Madam Chair and Senators, that's why we were very amenable to the compromise. That's why we understood that the huge impact of the first proposal was not sustainable and that we would look to programs such as what Ms. Duane is talking about to sustain the program to not readjust these fees as we go. Our, our discussion was let's be very practical, let's be pragmatic, let's introduce something that, that, is, that we see that is a much uh, a smaller amount and at least on paper right now unless demonstrated otherwise that these would be deal breakers in terms of uh, what transactions took place which we'll research the idea was stay here don't move in fact if there was such big transactions that, it, that the corpus became so large we would definitely look at and it was going to be a deal breaker in, in that economy uh, repealing or freezing to say, look, hold on to this. Make sure that this money is doing something. Governments, and I believe these senators sitting here agree, and all of us agree, government shouldn't do something like this and build up a big nest egg for nothing. I agree with you on the utilities issue. 
I mean, if that's something we're going to revisit, and I'm sure the senator and these senators want to see something done with that $9 million too that will go directly to our people and into the real estate market. I agree with that point that's been made today. So, uh, Ms. Duenas, you're absolutely right. That's why, uh, you know, if, if, if we implement this uh, with and, and, and ascertain the impacts, get this program off its feet, suggestions such like that you have, um, that people understand when they receive a benefit such as this, if they're going to sell their property, they pay back in. That's why the provisions in our current first-time homeowners, within five years you sell it, you pay back. But to generate revenue off of the goodwill of the government and fees collected, I think is, a, is definitely a solid program to sustain and to ensure that perhaps we don't, uh, you know, that's what sustains it as opposed to revisiting these fees again and saying, okay, let's go another quarter percent and the like. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to provide a comment or concern for Bill 145? No? May I yes, Mr. Something? Duenas, yes. You know, I think Chris, everybody acknowledges the program is good. I think it should try harder to get money from other sources. I think if the system development charge is $9 million in the bank, it's not being used, there's, you know, there are legislators. We have new blood in the legislatures. I think. You know, maybe taking a second look at the tomorrow land trust laws, I think, is game. And I think taking a look at the system development charge uh, accumulation to help out the first-time home buyers, perhaps that's something that the legislature should, uh, should take up. N noted. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Duenas. Okay, so if there's no one else that would like to provide comment on Bill Number 145, we are moving to... Oh, yes, Mr. Beaver, thank you. Yeah, this is, again, I want to reiterate it. We didn't just think about this this morning. We have looked and dug under every rock we can dig under for things. I know that everybody has a reason why they want to keep what they've got. So, but we're looking now to, and we're not looking for, for funds here to sustain the first time homeowner program. We're looking for funds to sustain housing programs. And we, and, we, and we want to mirror our programs after Hawaii, after Washington State, after California, after other, uh, after other places that have these programs in place. And there is, again, I, I go out there and look, and you'll find a lot of stuff out there. And like, like uh, the vice speaker said, she went very quickly here. She found it very quick, the fact that everybody uses what we're doing right now. And just because everybody else is using it, that might be a reason to think about it. But anyway, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now that we, um, if everyone's done providing comment, we'll address Bill Number 146. Bill Number 146 is uh, both of Article 7, Chapter 4, Title 12, Bond Code Annotated Relative to Increasing the First-Time Homeowner Assistant Program Eligible Transaction Contract Maximum Amount from 250000 to to 300000 So essentially what this bill does is just, um, what it is is we, we understand that the real estate market is changing. We understand that uh, houses are becoming more expensive um, and the market is just increasing to purchase a home. And so with this bill, we'd like to up the uh, transaction contract amount to $300,000 with the understanding that, okay, if I have um, a home that I'd like to purchase and it's, 200, it's $295,000, but the current amount is only at 250. I cannot get that closing cost uh, of $10,000 that the Guam Housing Corporation does um, assist with. So uh, the closing costs will remain the same. However, it ups the purchase of the home that you can. Um, that uh, it ups the cost of the home that you can purchase to $300,000. Um, understanding the evolving market range of how much it costs to buy a home on Guam. So. Yes. <laughs> so, so, Madam Chair, for the record, <laughs> we're fully in support uh, of Bill 146, and also, um, yes, uh, it, it actually came also in coordination with GAR. Uh, I'm sure we'll send them a note that this bill was heard, and uh, this is something that they had wanted, and, and something, one of the first things you looked at, uh, Madam Chair, uh, when uh, when we were first discussing uh, uh, my appointment and uh, your formation of an Africa Mumami. So this was an initiative uh, and we thank you for it. Um, there, as you know, uh, this is very timely too, 
because uh, you know the the mar as discussed the market shifting uh, we all know that real estate prices are going up home purchases are going up so 250,000 even at this time uh, is not necessarily for some markets considered now even uh, uh, in the affordable uh, home market uh, it's 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 rising quite a bit so going to 300,000 will allow a lot more families to avail themselves of this first time homeowners program which was well celebrated today and we'll also uh, but we'll keep the $10,000 limit, uh, Madam Chair, as you mentioned, so that we don't change the numbers of people who could possibly avail themselves of it. If we exponentially made that go up to say 12 or 15,000, then we could be taking other potential folks out of the out of the market and the availability to, uh, you know, to realize that 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 same um, opportunity. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. President. Is there anyone else that would like to provide comment for Bill 146 or any questions? Yeah. I have a question. Good afternoon. Um, yes, I, d I did want to uh, speak in favor of the support of this bill. I think this is a good bill uh, to increase the limit. Uh, so I just want to. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Madam Vice Speaker. I have a question for Guam Housing. Um, can you convince me that this number, what, what do you base the number on? I've seen the articles where uh, we, we've got some companies, you know, giving us some data, but what about Guam Housing? What kind of data do you use? Is it, I mean, how do you, why so, do you choose this number? Yeah, so based on our applications, if you go through the 487 or somewhere where we are right now, uh, you will see that um, uh, most of them, actually I don't never think we've given an award of 10,000 straight away. I think the closest was 9,800 and something. So if you look at the applications though, Madam Vice Speaker, uh, it's the applications that, that come in and or folks that come back and say, wow, I applied under this program and um, you know, we, we were making an offer on this house at, at you know, at, at, at 245 and then it came back that, you know, through the negotiation process it's 265. So they just fell right outside of that. So it's more anecdotal, but we could we could uh, accumulate that. Uh, but uh, working with the real estate uh, industry as well, you know, they thought 300,000 was going to be the new uh, threshold that would give that extra 50,000 of leeway from 250 to 300. But we, we could put that information together based on applications and those who had came, come back to us and said, wow, we, we just got out of that 250, uh, we could have uh, had it, but um, you know the the price changed by offerers. Appreciate that as our government representative, just so we have some kind of basis as to how we came up with this number, and sure. uh, of course with the with the input of the real real estate associations. Thank you. If I could just make one more comment, uh, in addition to just saying that we're in favor of the bill. Um, just to give a little background, obviously uh, right now it's, uh, it's a really uh, difficult market. Uh, by increasing that uh, amount, it would increase the inventory on what a buyer is able to, to look at. And as long as they qualify for that amount, uh, which is Guam Housing Corp is doing a tremendous job in making sure that they are, um, we feel confident that this will help our people and our first time home buyers. Thank you very much, sir. Does anyone else would like to comment on Bill 146? No? Okay. So that brings us to Bill 147. Bill 147 is an act to amend subsection 4103 and to add subsection 4103G. Correction. An act to amend 4103F and to add subsection 4103G. Both of Article cha 1, Chapter 4, Title 12, Guam Code Annotative relative to exempting Guam residents relocating to Guam for employment or to care for relatives due to medical reasons from the Guam Housing Corporation's first-time homeowners requirement and allowing Guam residents to obtain financing with the Housing Corporation to build or construct affordable typhoon-resistant homes on land trust property. And the, just, just a, a basic overview of this bill, the whole purpose of this bill is um, I'm a first-time homeowner, um, for example, and I already have a house, but I also have land trust property. Uh, this will allow me to utilize Guam Housing Corporation's programs 
to be able to uh, look for pro uh, ways to build my house on land trust property, also making me eligible for the first time homeowners um, program. So uh, this also will help stimulate the, the Chamorro land trust property for those that uh, have been currently awarded it and, and um, they'd like to build a home. It'll also address the utilities um, that they will require. And, and so it comes back full circle back into the housing market and to the economy, going directly back into our local economy. Uh, so if there's anybody else that'd like to comment on Bill 147, uh, please feel free. Thank you, Madam Speaker, or Madam Chairman. Um, Really, my only comments on this bill is just the technicalities of the description of land trust. I, I would really uh, encourage that the bill be uh, corrected, to, that it would refer to anything that sounds like it's supposed to be the Chamorro Land Trust Commission to, to reflect it in, uh, as to the Chamorro Land Trust Commission. Um, I also want to, to correct, and you know, it's, it's throughout the, uh, the, the, the preface of the bill but in Section 3, where it is really the meat of the bill, um, you know, the individuals uh, don't acqu acquire or inherit Chamorro Land Trust property. Rather, you know, it's, it's, it should be referred to as residential and agricultural leases uh, uh, so that um, there's no, there is a distinction. It's not eligible for people who might have commercial leases and whatnot um, or any other kind of licenses that are not really what it's intended for. But overall, I, I really support what the general idea of this bill is about, um, the idea of making sure that people who do build homes on these properties uh, are doing it with their long-term interest uh, at hand. I mean, we've seen two recent natural disasters, which we are highly susceptible of having, um, and, and the importance of being able to, to shelter in place, or at least when you come back home, it's still there and uh, having some typhoon proof uh, facilities. We've been talking with Guam Housing on some of the concepts. We've been working with Guam Housing on, on some housing and, and different forms of housing to ensure that they're, they're typhoon rated, they're insurable, because it's of interest when someone puts in that kind of investment into their home. It will be their largest investment that it's sustainable for uh, through, throughout the, through a natural disaster like a typhoon. So um, we encourage and, and, and generally support this bill with the corrections to specifically talk about Chamorro Land Trust in, in its entirety rather than just in general terms of, as a trust. Thank you, Mr. Borja. Vice Speaker? Did, did Guam, does Guam Housing support this bill? It, Madam Vice Speaker, yes, we do support this bill. And, and um, if I can make a few comments. Yeah, so essentially, uh, First of all, Chris Duane Guam Housing, we do support this, uh, this legislation. I um, want to be clear that anyone under the first time uh, uh, homeowners applying for Guam Housing loans under this bill with this amendment would, of course, still have to um, uh, qualify under all of our uh, loan requirements. Madam Vice Speaker, I, I think that one, one example that I'm going to go ahead and give you so maybe there's a clearer understanding. Uh, on, on Chamorro Land Trust eligibility sometimes and, and a lot of times uh, the recipient because it is there, there is um, um, right to survivorship you you have situations whereby um, you know a, a current um, um, em, employed individual with a lot of security going forward has the ability to build uh, insurable and suitable households on Chamorro Land Trust property whereas those they may pass it down to may not and so by not having that opportunity under the first time homeowners uh, or those who relocated to take care of maybe sick family members, they have a house in the states so they wouldn't qualify but under this provision for the amendment they would still be a first time homeowner on Guam would allow for, for that as well. We all know that that is, a, is, is actually a, a growing uh, um, um, group of individuals coming back to Guam for that purpose. So it really allows uh, for, for the development and opportunity uh, for additional folks to, to avail themselves of, of, of building a, a proper uh, household on Chamorro Land Trust property. So uh, with that, we are in support of this legislation. Can I ask, what does G uh, in Section 3 give you that you don't already have? 
think that's the part that says, I think that's the part that says you have to be a first time home buyer. And that's the big issue right there is to remove that provision so that you don't have to be a first time home buyer. Is that correct? That's correct. So it extends it out to, uh, it extends it out and, and then opens up um, uh, that, that individual who, who it removes that, that requirement and kind of expands um, their ability to. So this would allow Guam Housing them. to help uh, those who want to build homes on Chamorro Land Trust who are not first-time homeowners. That's correct. So it's a it's a it's a big exception for everybody, anyone. It, it really is, but most especially for those who qualify for the program, because if they're locked out right now, say for example, a parent with children, right. and they don't qualify under the current statute, and they say, okay. I could build a house for my child. Yes, but you would be risk. giving uh, first-time homeowner money to people who are not first-time homeowners. That's the big difference with we this would, bill. We would, we would want that. Yeah. Isn't that what you're doing? No, we're allowing them to avail themselves of our program, which means if they're which going is to... Which normally only availed by people who are f going to be first-time homeowners. Correct. But, yeah, but, but at this point, otherwise, uh, they... they how would they do improvements on Chamorro Land Trust property? You know, you got to remember, Guam Housing is the only one who can, right now, other than uh, uh, veterans, that, that would do conventional loans. So it's kind of a disadvantage to those who have Chamorro Land Trust property that don't fall into that category, but they're first-time homeowners on Chamorro Land Trust property. So we're kind of disenfranchising a group of people that, that could help their family and can help others building a house on Chamorro Land Trust property right. because the bank won't finance that. The bank will finance okay. your own uh, fee simple, but okay. they won't finance um, um, Chamorro Land Trust leasehold. All right, what about um, provision F in section two? Does the Guam Housing Corporation support that? This one makes an exemption for residents. Normally there's a residency requirement and I guess this makes an exemption to that residency requirement for those who relocate to Guam for employment or in order to care for relatives due to, so this would, this would allow those who are, or, go ahead. Yeah, I believe, I, I'm um, uh, Mr. Vice Speaker, right. I believe there's a five, uh, my name is Cesar Villanueva, I'm also on the special assistant to Mr. Duenas, Guam Housing. Yeah, there is a five year requirement, residency year requirement for it, so. That may have to be addressed though. One of the biggest issues here was that if a person is coming out here and they can't get a loan to get a house, even though they may have sold one someplace else. And they come out here for, for take a, the biggest thing is your teachers. We run into those all the time. And if they can't get a loan through the, through the banks, we had to previously owned a home, then they, they, can, they won't get one. So the biggest issue here was to address anybody that needed a loan that could not get a loan, but also do not provide them any other first time homeowner programs, like the grant programs, or the CAHOT programs, or those kind of programs. No, that would be, that would be something, that would be fair, huh? Yeah, yeah so, so once again, to go back to uh, embedded in our testimony, as you know, uh, as Clyde mentioned, uh, folks who may be in, in nursing or teaching that I want to go back to Guam, I want to live in my place and serve there. They, but they, had, they were homeowners in other jurisdictions. They sold that house and so they're resettling. They don't have the five-year residency requirement, but they're Chamorros. They're from here. They're our own people, and say, so they're going to borrow, and they're going to, uh, you know, get a loan through us, or they're going to borrow to build on Chamorro Land Trust if they're eligible. Without this, with this residency requirement as it is, our own people coming home to try to get help from us can't get it if this stays this way. So we could, we, if we change it, we open the market. Another thing is, as we mentioned earlier, family members coming back home to take care of ill family members. Uh, you know, if they have to relocate for that reason, they, they sold their property, they're not necessarily first-time homeowners, they don't have the residency, but they're from here, they're moving back. And if for what that financial constraint, if they're helping their family and they fall below what conventional banking uh, would give them, but their risk is okay for us, it meets our minimum requirements, we can loan them and allow them to go to home. Does, does Guam Housing not have a 
a long list of people who are already on Guam who want this type of assistance? Are you looking for additional people to give assistance to? I mean, no, it sounds no. like you don't have a waiting list or anything like no, that. We is do. that, is we that do. right? No, we do, but we're the, we're the only lending, lending institution to build on Chamorro Land CPC Trust property, property that will give financing. So, Senator, Vice Speaker, unless they have a bag full of money, come back home with $200,000 and they're recipients of Chamorro Land Trust, then they can build their house in cash, they're lucky. But if they need financing, <coughs> any one of these conventional banks won't give them um, 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 financing. I guess I'm just, I can think, I, I appreciate the exemption, you know, and, and the causes why they, of these people returning home, but I can think of many others also, right? And so I guess I'm wondering then why have a five-year residency requirement at all if, if we're going to create exceptions to it? I mean, and what happens, how to, what happens to those people who have been waiting if you do have a waiting list and, right. and I don't know, it just the, the, seems well, real a little quick, bit unfair. This is not exclusive. This will not bump anybody out of line. And it will not bump anybody That's what I'm asking. You must have enough resources to go beyond what you've got on your waiting list. Is that right? Well, if the bill passes for the housing <laughs> trust fund, there will be resources. We could, we could call these companion measures. <laughs> we just want to put people in homes. It's, it's, there's 8,000 people on the list, and many of them have been on that list for a while. They have leases. Some of them have uh, leases are close to expiration. They need to develop, and the only people, the only financial institution is GHC. And we need, to, we need to do that, we really do. Let me, have, let me say one more thing here. Yeah, the five-year residency requirements is, is for grant programs and special programs, and not for lending programs, so yeah. So, so why is this exemption necessary? The big, the big reason is, and I'm a good example right here. When I first came over here myself, I couldn't get a loan. No, I mean, not but that. It's like I, you're, I thought you were trying to make yeah. an exemption for, to, of, of the residency requirements, and you're saying it's not, there no, is no, there's no requirement. There's no, there's no residency requirement for a loan. There's only a residency, a residency requirement for special programs. So, yeah, that's not fair. But the big thing is, is when you have people coming over here that cannot get a loan someplace else, then they need to be, they need to, they need to be able to come see us. And that's the biggest, and that's the big thing we're trying, we're trying to eliminate here. And, and this, came, this thing came about about a year and a half ago when somebody was in the governor's office and he asked us to look into it. He says, why don't we remove our provisions from being a first-time homeowner provision for lending capital, for loans, to, to, to a lender of last resort? All right, if you look at F, F is, uh, it, it says, uh, those, I guess, you know, trying to make an exemption for having been a previous homeowner. It says, um, encourage um, what, purchase or construction permanent homes by the residents of Guam who have not previously been homeowners, exempting, however, residents who relocate. So um, I, in, if you read the intent of the bill, you say something else. In the intent of the bill, it says after you want to exempt those who relocate after having sold their homes or residences in the U.S. or elsewhere. So what you want to exempt is, first time, they already have been homeowners. We're trying to, it was our intent to remove the exemption of the first time homeowner right there. Okay. But to make sure they did not, well, did not. And you already have um, no requirement for residency for the loans? No. Okay, no. all right, no. thank you very much. And, and just if, if I may, um, in essence, um, they would be first-time homeowners on Guam. Yes, right. And so it's yeah. not, uh, it's the fact that they would be first-time homeowners on Guam, it's, that, 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 that was the whole point behind it, that they relocated. But, uh, so yes. Okay. Is there anyone else that would like to comment on Bill 147? I believe the USDA uses that definition also. Oh, thank you, Mr. Beaver. Thank you for that. Okay, so if no one else likes to comment, I thank everyone for coming today. Um, 
Thank you for your support, uh, your comments, your recommendations. We will definitely take all the recommendations um, for these bills and the concerns and see where we can find a, a middle ground, you know, um, especially uh, in reference to the landlord tenant bill. Um, something, we must do something as a community to improve this law. Um, like I said, there was, there hasn't been much, much attention afforded it um, in legislation and uh, I'm looking forward to working with the Real Estate Commission and all community members and stakeholders, uh, especially to address this bill. So thank you very much. Um, we welcome all recommendation and comments. Uh, we anticipated our public hearing to be next week. Uh, however, I think we're gonna take a little bit more time to chew on this um, and uh, see what we can do in the month of October. Um, I, I think the Real Estate Commission also has some concerns they'd like to share. So in the spirit of um, working together as a team, I'd like to wait for everyone so that they have their fair time to meet with us and discuss their concerns. Okay, so thank you everyone and you have a good day, God bless.